This is happening right now. Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul are in Brooklyn calling on the federal government to provide expedited work authorization for asylum seekers. Let's go to that now. Applause to our mayor, Eric Adams. Thank you. We also have the dean of the congressional delegation. Jerry Nadler has joined us, a strong, important voice for us in Washington, D.C. Joined by Congressman Dan Goldman. We are in your house. This is your district as well. And thank you for all you're doing for us uh, and your focus on helping us solve problems. Kathy Wild, uh, the president of the Partnership New York City. I want to tell you, whenever there's a crisis, uh, you are there to roll up your sleeves with all of us and to bring the business community to bear and the influence that you have. So thank you, Kathy, for uh, working on this issue with us as well. Uh, Dan Riggi, I want to thank you. It's, or, or, Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, we've seen each other at many, many events, but when you harness the power of the restaurants and the hotels and all the employers, there's a great story you're going to hear unfold here today about great possibilities, great opportunities that thus far have been overlooked, and we're looking to capitalize on them today and put a lot more people to work in your facilities as well. We are so fortunate to have the leader of the New York State, AFL-CIO, again, bringing labor to the issue as well, and I want to thank Mario Salento for his support for us as well. And you're going to hear from Yaver Rada, an asylum seeker who traveled a great distance who came with his little child from Venezuela and literally arrived here just a few weeks ago. He is going to tell you about the experience of being one of those individuals who found their way to our great city and our great state. So you'll be hearing from him momentarily. Thank you, Yvair. Thank you. Uh, Union Square Hospitality Group, this is extraordinary. And I want to thank you again, Danny, for hosting us here. And you think about some of the greatest establishments we have in the city. They have Danny's name associated with them. But one of the barriers holding back even more success is the challenge of finding workers. Uh, Danny and I had this conversation literally just a couple days ago. And this is going to affect the future and the viability of our restaurants when people, and I'm hearing not just in the city, but all over the state, only be able to have you know, shorter hours, reducing the days they're open having only serve uh, half of a dining room instead of the whole dining room because there are not enough workers here in the state of New York. And so this is an issue that's affecting our economy. It's not just individuals. It's affecting us with this historic labor shortage. But at the same time, we have a historic labor shortage. We also have this unprecedented influx of in individuals arriving in New York, all of them legally seeking asylum. They're eager to work. They want to work. They came here in search of work and a new future, and they can become part of our economy and part of our communities. And people are ready to start training them right in facilities like we have here today. So today, we are joined, all these leaders and all of you, in a common goal that is to get them situated, these asylum seekers situated, get them shelter, get them food, get them legal services, and then help them get to work. And so these are yet challenges, but what a great opportunity for us here in New York. And I have to say, over the last many, many months, a year ago, longer than a year ago, the mayor and his team have been asked to do the impossible. But he rose up. He put so much muscle behind the effort to find homes for these individuals any way he could, leaving no stone unturned. And he recognized, you know, now that we have over 70,000 people fleeing difficult, terrifying circumstances, whether it's an oppressive regime in Venezuela, economic circumstances, great poverty, oppression, gang violence. Decades of this have forced people who otherwise would be just as comfortable living at home in their own communities to have to flee those circumstances. And so, Mayor, I want to thank you again on behalf of the people of this state for the way you just stood up to this challenge didn't run away, didn't shirk it, and said, let's figure this out. And that is the kind of leadership that is so critically important. That is why your partnership on this is so important. And you recognize these are individuals who deserve compassion and dignity. And I'm talking about Yaver, who talked, who just crossed the border from Texas three weeks ago with his one-year-old and a six-month-old child. How terrifying could that have been? How terrifying 
not knowing when you're traveling with an infant what the next day is going to bring. Will there be people on the road who want to do you harm? Will there be enough food and water the next day? Imagine the terror of what he went through, but he was unrelenting in his pursuit of giving his little daughter a better life. It's an extraordinary story. And now he's applying for asylum to be part of the New York family. And New York has been working so hard to provide individuals like this what they need. New York City is the number one destination for asylum seekers who have been released from federal custody, who are waiting their next steps in the process. Now, we know why. New York is an incredible place to live. But it also has conferred a lot of responsibility. And the fact that right now there are over 42,000 people sheltered, safely sheltered in this city, shows the effectiveness of the mayor's operation, but also the compassion of the people here in New York. Because this is a humanitarian crisis, not created by this city, not created by this state, but it doesn't matter. Blaming doesn't help. We're in executive positions where you have to just manage. And that's what we have to do. But we've helped. I want to thank my partners in state government, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, the leader of the Senate, Carl Heasty, our speaker, the entire legislature, for seeing that more resources would be needed. And that's why, just a few weeks ago, we passed $1 billion in our budget to provide for supportive services, housing, and legal services. And I've committed to the mayor. I'm sure that's not the end of it. We'll just leave it at that right now. But we're going to make sure you have what you need, Mayor. We're going to make sure you have what you need, because we are committed to getting this right. And we'll continue to work closely with you. Right now, we have members of my senior team literally embedded, working shoulder to shoulder to deal with finding space, you know, just emergency shelters wherever we can find it. We have over 1,500 National Guard members. What are they doing? Building cribs, running out for food, making you feel secure helping people apply for their asylum status, becoming a friend to people. And I want to thank our National Guard. Uh, this is a hurricane of sorts, and they've been out there since for many, many months. And I want to thank them for what they're doing. And we are identifying additional shelters. The city is overflowing. The mayor has used every ounce of creativity with him and his team to find space, and we are asking for more space. We're looking at hangars at JFK. We've asked for Floyd Bennett Field to stand up a major operation. We have other facilities we've been talking about. We'll be announcing more on that briefly. But we need all levels of government to respond to this. We truly, truly do. And I've been working with our partners in Washington since last summer with the mayor, trying to find how we can be more flexible in ensuring that these individuals can get a quicker path to a legal work status. I visited Washington again just a few days ago, in constant communicate yesterday with the White House. They know what we need. We need money. We need new places for shelter. And we need support. But more than anything, and why we're united here today with business and labor and advocates, and I do want to mention the New York Immigration Coalition is here as well. What an extraordinary job they've been doing. More than anything, we need changes to the work authorization policies that will let these individuals not have to wait months and possibly years for that legal status, but let's get it in an expedited basis. So we think it's possible. Right now, you have to wait 180 days after you file for your legal asylum status. That is the big unknown. People come here. They're desperate. They're trying to figure out how to just get on their feet. They don't know the language. And the burden of trying to properly fill out the asylum papers, and then if you're missing something that someone's actually going to find you to update the application, then at some point you're going to go see a judge. We don't have enough judges here in the state of New York. So start sending some judges up, and the clerical staff give us the support we need so they can start properly filling out the asylum process. But. Once that's done under the current rules, they then have to wait 180 more days in limbo, not able to work legally in the state of New York. That's not working. That's not a solution. They're ready to work, they're willing to work, and they're not able to work. So 
We're spending a lot of money. We're dealing what we can, but we need this help from Washington. And again, I want to thank our partners, and I've been in constant communication with Majority Leader Schumer almost daily on this issue for many months. Our Senators Kirsten Gillibrand, all the members here, and the entire delegation. We need this change in policy from Washington to allow Mario Salento and Danny Meyer and Kathy Wilde to go back to everyone they represent and say, we've solved this crisis. We have people. So when you think about what we have open right now, I know upstate. I know exactly where it starts, too. There are over 5,000 farm jobs, 5,000 farm jobs open as we speak. The cows don't wait to be milked. The plants need to be maintained and harvested in a few months, the crops. We have more than 5,000 food service jobs right now. I'm a former waitress. I made pizzas, chicken wings, waited tables, cleaned floors, did pots and pans. Doesn't take a lot of skill. I was 15 years old. Those jobs are available. 4,000 openings for janitors, cleaners, and housekeepers. As I mentioned, the jobs for farm workers as well. So we're grateful that the Biden administration has instituted a new border process, starting with the suspension of Title 42 on May 11th. We all know that date well. And that will allow asylum seekers from other countries to seek sponsorship and to apply from their home countries. And if they don't, they will be turned back. So that is a shift in policy which we hope will be successful and mitigate the flow of new arrivals here. But in the meantime, we know who we have. They've been coming in daily. And we have to deal with the number of individuals with us now, whether it stays 71,000 or it's up to 80. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to deal with it. And also, one thing we're doing is having our Department of Agriculture and Markets connect with Cornell University and finding people who do have work authorization, because some people have applied successfully. They're already able to work on our farms. But that doesn't help the problems we have right now. So again, this is an ask. We're asking again. We're pleading, saying this is a great opportunity here in the state of New York to solve two problems, how to help these people get on their feet and support their families. And my God, who in this city has not come from somewhere else, their family? And I took note of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island as I came here this morning. A reminder of my teenage grandparents who fled great poverty in Ireland over a century ago. Grandpa found job working at a wheat field in South Dakota as a migrant farm worker. Then they were domestic servants in the city of Chicago until they found jobs as union workers making steel in Buffalo. Their children, eight children packed into a tiny house, became business leaders, school superintendents, educators, and a granddaughter even became a governor. That's what happens in one generation. In one generation, people's lives are transformed, they're changed. That is the story of New York. And let us have the power to give that same right, that same opportunity to people to say, yes, you're part of our family. We welcome you. And you're going to help us get to a crisis. The shortage of workers, we can solve for it. And that is the great opportunity we have before us today. And no one knows that better than our mayor. And we are working so closely together. And I also want to say to parts of our country and our state who are enacting bigoted policies based on fear and intimidation, join us. Join us. Let people know the true story of what New York is. It was not putting out those signs, even though Grandpa saw Irish need not apply. Eventually, those signs came down, and people were welcoming. And everything about this state and this country changed as a result. So we're going to give people jobs, give them opportunities. We just need a little bit of help. And that's what today is all about. Mayor, thank you. Thank you for being the leader when the city needed you most. Our great mayor, Mayor Eric Adams.
really want to thank our governor. She was in City Hall uh, one day last week. She came by to sit down and speak with me about this crisis. I think governor, uh, the first time a governor was in City Hall, seeing a man a long time. And to have you there showed me how you understood firsthand how this crisis, uh, probably one of the greatest humanitarian crises that has hit our city a long time. But I join with you in saying in crises, there's opportunities. And you have really led from the front. You have allowed your team to come in and be part of our administration as my team leaders organize and move the number of people, resources, and places to execute this plan. And, you know, there are two moments in life, as I say to uh, our friends in the media. There is a I gotcha moment, and there is I got you moment. And some of the things we are seeing is really working against the people of this city. We received last week over 50. 5,800 asylum seekers. While we are speaking with Washington and others to report that we are not having a crisis of this proportion, it's just counterproductive. It is hurting our fight. And we are all in this city together it doesn't matter if you are a messenger or a reporter. This is our city. And we should be clear on this moment that this challenge is of epic proportion. And some of the reporting that is indicating we are not dealing with the crisis is hurting what we are attempting to accomplish. I am pleading with you that we should have a level of accuracy in what is happening during this particular period of time. Some of the reporting is not reflecting that, and it is unfair to the people of this city. 5,800 people came to our city last week. Those are factual numbers. They're not made up numbers. And we are seeing the week before 4,200. Just in one location alone, we had over 800. Not only by buses, through the airports, through cars, through every mode of transportation. And our administration has accurately reported the information to the best of our ability to partner with the governor's office to monitor and to address this crisis. And to my congressional delegation, uh, Congressman uh, Nadler and Congressman Ryan, who are both here, Congressman Nadler, uh, from the beginning of this crisis, and our visits with him in Washington, being the dean of our congressional delegation, I cannot say thank you enough for really uh, pushing to get the resources here with our minority leader in Congress and our senior senator, Senator Schumer, who, uh, with his coordination, we were able to get $800 million in the omnibus bill. Uh, it's unfortunate, out of the $350 million, New York City only received $30 million, and those bordering states received, in some cases, more than we, what we did, and they're using the money to bus individuals to New York City. This is what we are up against. This is a symbol of our nation, as the governor alluded to. The lady that sits in our harbor welcomed countless number of immigrants to these shores throughout generations. 
Merely in 1907 alone, a million people went through that amazing island we call Ellis Island, also called the Island of Hope, the Island of Hop Opportunity. That hope did not dissipate merely throughout the years and generations. That hope is still alive. And those who come here come here for one reason only, and that is to participate in the American dream. That dream should not become a nightmare when they hit our shores. I think often about the dream of the dreamer of my commissioner of immigrant affairs, coming from Mexico with his family, pursuing the American dream, and now reaching the point where he is in charge of those who come to this country. Commissioner Castro is a symbol of those who are coming here today and would like to participate in what this country has to offer. Our immigrants helped build this country. They helped generate the greatest economic expansion in history. Thousands of asylum seekers continue to arrive at our border. We see history in motion once more. And the history books are going to judge us based on our interactions and reactions on how we responded, just as history judged us on how we responded to our early Irish, Italians, Greek, Africans, and other people from the diasporas across the globe. Uh, people are on the move in search of the same dream that we've all had and we all are pursuing, the American dream. If these asylum seekers cannot work, if they cannot work, it is going to be a major impediment and interruption in the pursuit of that dream. And that is all they ask for. When I speak with my asylum seekers at, at the Herks, at the hotels, on the streets, they state clearly, we don't want your free room and board and food and clothing. We want to work. We want to have an opportunity to provide for ourselves. And right now, we are denying that opportunity by refusing to let them work legally. It is creating an underground market where individuals could be exploited, unable to pay into our tax base, working long and difficult and dangerous jobs because they are living in the shadow of the American dream and not out front. It increases the risk that they can be abused. It is one of the major goals we must accomplish. And so today, we stand with our business leaders. We cannot thank them enough for what they are saying as they realize this problem is all of our problems. Uh, Kathy Weil and the partnership and others are stepping up and saying we are ready to hire if we are given the authorization to do so. We have one message, let them work. That is our clear message that we're sending. We must expedite work authorization for asylum seekers, not in the future, but now. In New York City, throughout our state and across the country, we have thousands of unfilled jobs, including jobs right here in Industry City in Brooklyn. And as the governor indicated, across the board, backstretch workers in our racing industry, agriculture, food service, home care, transportation and manufacturing fields all need labor. And the lady in the harbor right behind us reminds us every day who we are as a city and as a nation, a place of hope and opportunity where people can get a job and do their part of pursuing and building on the American dream. And that's what I hear over and over again. They want to work. And they continue to ask the question. The question they ask in El Paso, the question they ask in Brownsville, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, Washington, and New York City. They're asking, can we work? Can we work? That is the precursor to sleep that allows you to experience the American dream. Without it, it turns it into a nightmare. And it would take us the action 
to fulfill this dream. We can do this by direct action by the executive branch of the federal government. Without legislation, we can get this done. Republicans, have, as we know, have blocked all attempts at fixing our broken immigration system, intentionally causing chaos and dysfunction. We cannot believe all of a sudden that's going to change with a Republican-controlled Congress. If we don't get it done through a presidential action, we are going to slow down the progress we need. So we're calling on the White House, the United States Department of Homeland Security, to ensure our newest Americans can work lawfully and build stable lives for themselves and our countries. Our leaders in Washington must redesignate and extend temporary protective status, also known as TPS. And we want to be included those from Venezuela, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Sudan, South Sudan, Cameroon, and other nations. Given the continuing Russian humanitarian crisis in those countries, they are going to pursue the stability that our country has to offer. The federal government must also expand and extend access to humanitarian parole for asylum seekers already in the United States and processed at the border, as well as increase the number of United States citizens and immigration officers to have the opportunity but not have access to the opportunity because of the lack of personnel is defeating the entire purpose. What we see happening on our border is not new. It is a logical and human response to hunger, violence, and political instability in other countries. In an ideal situation, all Americans will do their part. And I want to thank New Yorkers who have stepped up, volunteered, participated, and have done their part on so many levels. Instead of putting the responsibility squarely on the cities in general and specifically in New York City, we must have the responsibility for care to have the national decompression strategy that is deserved of this crisis we are facing. We must help our fellow arrivals to be a participant in the American dream. And I have described New York City as a city of yes, so often, but that spirit of innovation and inclusive, inclusiveness is foundational to this entire nation. America is a country of yes, not only New York City. Yes to immigrants, yes to new housing, jobs, and opportunities, yes to the can-do spirit that built our great nation. These asylum seekers came here looking for the American dream, a chance to work and build successful lives. Let's give them a fighting chance at making this dream a reality. And that fighting chance comes with our business community. And we cannot thank them enough for what they have done, as I indicated and as the governor alluded to. And leading that challenge on so many fronts is uh, my good friend and a great New Yorker, uh, Kathy Wow, well from the partnership. Kathy. I just want to say that the business community of the city and state is totally behind Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams and what they are trying to do. We're trying to send the same message to Washington that we need, we need help now. And we also, this is not just a humanitarian issue. This is an economic issue. We are a world global center capital of finance, of business, of innovation. And that's for one reason, because we are a welcoming place. New York has welcomed immigrants historically, and they have built a great city and state for us. And from here, they've gone on to the whole country to build a great country. Our immigration policy is failing us today. The city and states around the country are trying to make up for it. We really need national leadership, and we're so grateful for our own members of our congressional delegation who are making that effort. The business community stands behind you. One of the leaders of that effort, who's going to, I'm going to introduce now, is our host today, Danny Meyer. 
the executive chair and founder of Union Square Hospitality. So, Danny. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Union Square events. I want to thank my team for putting this together on very short notice. But the reason we had such short notice is that Governor Hochul was able to uh, take this initiative very, very quickly and say, we have an opportunity. We have a two-sided problem. As Mayor Adams just said, we, on one hand, we have a humanitarian crisis. And as you've heard from Kathy Wild and also from Governor Hochul, we have a business crisis, which has been going on since even before COVID, which is that there are not enough talented workers who have a heart for hospitality, who have a work ethic for all the jobs that we could make available. The hospitality industry is the largest single employer outside of government in the United States. The same thing is true in the state of New York City, and excuse me, the state of New York and in the city of New York. If you look at all the jobs that are associated with hospitality, the people who produce the food, the people who cook the food, the people who serve the food, the people who grew the food, the people who, who have everything to do with it, we have a solution to another problem looking for a solution. If we had a situation, imagine if for all the job openings that we have had that does not permit our industry to work at its greatest potential. If we had a situation where we learned that 5,000 people came in yesterday who wanted to work, we would say, hallelujah, we, sign us up. We will put recruiting tables out immediately and we will do the best job we can on two fronts. Number one, to train those people. And I'm here to tell you that, that the, the, the United Hospitality Industry is as united as it could possibly be wanting to help solve this problem. During COVID, which brought our industry to its knees because we were not permitted to do what we do, we couldn't welcome people into our restaurants. What could we do? We banded together as a community to help each other. 26,000 restaurants in New York City, probably a half a million restaurants in America, banded together and said, how can we help each other? Well, we have learned to work together, and I will tell you right now that this industry wants to provide a solution to this crisis. And when we do provide that solution, it's going to help the economy, and it's going to be the right thing to do. Here's what we commit to. We commit to providing job training for people who want to work. As, as a community, as a business, our whole industry wants to do this right now. Number two, when we train people, and I will tell you that many, many of the jobs that are open today do not take more than five to six weeks of training for someone who, as I said, has a heart for hospitality and a good work ethic. In five to six weeks of training, which we will commit to helping with in facilities all over the state, all over the city, we will then commit to hiring people. And I'll take it a step further. If we could play a role in actually having somebody on their path to legal asylum who proves that they want to be a great citizen because they were a great worker, we will participate in that program as well. So the last thing I want to say is that yesterday, as luck would have it, I was on a, uh, a chat at the a fireside chat at the National Restaurant Association show in Chicago, which is the biggest gathering of the hospitality industry in our country. It happens every year in May. And on the stage with me was the president and CEO of the NRA, the other NRA, the National Restaurant Association, <laughs> Michelle Korsman. And I took the opportunity during one of her questions to do what I've learned so well from some of the great politicians in this room. And I answered her question with the answer I wanted to give. And I started talking about this crisis and this opportunity. 4,000 people in the audience. When I brought this up, 4,000 members of the hospitality industry rose up with a standing ovation. And then the president and CEO of the National Restaurant Association said, let us know what we can do to help. So we are unified. Look who's in this room right now. We have the greatest delegation we could possibly have. We're committed, 
and we want to be any kind of help we can. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to somebody who took a leadership role and has taken a leadership role well before COVID, but certainly I would say the degree to which the New York City restaurant community got back on its feet is because of the leadership of Andrew Ridgey, who's the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Andrew. Thank you, Danny. Um, governor, Mayor, all the leaders here, thank you. You know, we always hear it. New York City is a melting pot for people from around the world. And nowhere is that better reflected than in our city and our state's restaurants. The cultures, the backgrounds, the flavor, the cuisine, people all around the world make it world renowned. You know, we've always provided opportunities to immigrants, people that are seeking better lives, including my great grandparents that escaped persecution, came here to New York City. A lot of hard work and at opening bakeries, cafes, right here in Brooklyn, then in Queens. We know immigrants are the backbone of the hospitality industry. They're essential to the fabric of our communities, but also vital not just to the local, but also the national economy. That's why this issue is personal to me and for I know millions of other people. Now today, like Danny said, I represent the city's hospitality industry, the restaurant industry right here in New York. And every single day, I hear from restaurateurs in neighborhoods throughout the five boroughs. They are struggling to find the people they need to run their restaurants. It makes it tougher for everyone. They can't find people. They want to fill their job openings. Being short-staffed hurts their businesses, and it also hurts the consumer experience. But to address the staffing shortage, what restaurateurs say, they need to be able to provide lawful work to the recently arrived migrants that are seeking asylum. So they can fill those job openings, they can run their restaurants, they can stimulate our economy, but also so these folks can support themselves and support their families and not have to rely on government. But to allow this, we need the federal government to act now. We need them because we cannot wait any longer. While they debate, people want to work. Our restaurateurs want to provide those work opportunities. And as the governor and the mayor said, New York has stepped up in a tremendous way. Enormous responsibility, caring for these folks, caring for their family. Now it is time for the federal government to step up and authorize these local businesses to be able to hire the asylum seekers. We do have really big challenges on our hands, but by delaying and slowing down work authorization for thousands of people that are already here in America, it only serves to exacerbate those challenges that exist. But there's an easy solution to address one of these challenges, authorize work authorization quickly. We need it now. It's time to permit it. So we're urging the Biden administration, Congress, all the folks, rise above whatever the politics are and let's unite around a policy that should all unite us. Honest work, delicious meals, great restaurants, the American dream. It's not only about what's doing morally right, it's also about what is economically right, and in the case of the restaurant industry, it's about what's gastronomically right. So I wanna thank you all, we urge you, authorize these folks to be able to work and help support New York and our country. So with that, I want to thank everyone again, and I want to bring up Mario Salento, the president of the New York State AFL-CIO. Thank you, thank you. Um, the labor movement strongly supports uh, making the temporary protective status as expansive as possible because we want to help these men and women to achieve the American dream, and we know that the foundation of that dream is being able to provide a better life and a better future for your family. We also know that with the status comes additional protections in the workplace. We can protect these men and women from being exploited, whether it's wage and hour laws, whether it's safety and health standards. So we, we owe them that. We owe them that responsibility. 
And the last piece is this, and I think this is the most important. When these men and women go to work, they earn that paycheck, they pay income taxes. And on those taxes, it allows them to become positive contributors to our economy, positive contributors to our tax base, which means that 19 million New Yorkers prosper and benefit as a result of that. Why? Because our local and state governments are now better able to provide all of the public services that every single New Yorker relies on. Education, health care, sanitation, transportation, law enforcement, firefighters, on and on and on. Productive members of our society helping all of us. We all win. And that's why, um, on behalf of the New York State AFL-CIO, on behalf of the entire labor movement in this state, two and a half million members from Buffalo to Long Island. First, I want to thank Governor Hochul. Thank you, Governor, for leading this effort. The labor movement in this state will work with you in any capacity necessary to let us achieve our goals. And we'll also certainly work with the mayor and all of our friends in the business community as well. We have an opportunity for all of the men and women who risked everything that they have to come to this country to give themselves and their families a better life. We have an opportunity to give them a standard of living and a quality of life that they can be proud of. But more than that, more than that, if we are successful in that endeavor, we will raise the standard of living and quality of life for 19 million New Yorkers. And that's something we can all strive for and be proud of. Thank you very much. And with that, I, um, thank you. I want to uh, introduce Evert Rada, who's an asylum speaker, and he will speak and close the program. Speech will be translated live by Manuel Castro, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Gracias por la oportunidad de permitirme contar mi historia. Mi nombre es Ivert Rada, tengo 24 años. My name is Ivert Rada, I am 24 years old. Eh, Emprendí el gran viaje como muchos y miles de mis compañeros lo han hecho, atravesando la temida cebla del Darién. I took on this journey like many of us have done, crossing the, uh, the fearful jungle of El Darién. Y seis, con, seis países más, el cual nos permitió llegar a esta gran ciudad como Nueva York, que nos recibió con las puertas, con los brazos abiertos. And I crossed six other countries to arrive here to New York, who has opened the doors for us. Eh, actualmente tengo 20 días. Tengo al tercer día de llegar a Nueva York, la organización Sin Fines de Lucro Nights nos recibió con los brazos abiertos. I have only been here for 20 days. On the third day that I arrived, I came to Nights, who es una, opened their doors. Es una organización muy importante que nos está ayudando a nosotros los emigrantes que llegamos aquí sin recursos. An organization that has been helping immigrants like myself who have no other way to go. El cual nos está enseñando cuáles son nuestros derechos y nuestros deberes. We are learning there what are our rights and also our responsibility. Actualmente me están estoy haciendo la preparación. Ya tengo lo, el taller de demolición y el framing. I have been uh, engaging in their training. I have uh, now a license to do. Uh, many of these jobs that are required. Y estoy en curso de Locha. El miércoles ya es mi graduación. Están todos cordialmente invitados. I am in the OSHA training. Uh, I am graduating this Wednesday. All of you are welcome to join me. <laughs> este, quisiera recalcar que muchos de nosotros los inmigrantes necesitamos apoyo. Muchas gracias a todos por tratar de ayudarnos a todos. I just want to say that, you know, thank you for all the help that you have uh, brought us, uh, given us. Many of us are in need of support right now. Ya que venimos para acá, somos gente trabajadora, la cual venimos para acá. We are hardworking people and we are came here to do that. A buscar un mejor futuro para nuestra familia digna. Y queremos aportar mucho a la gran ciudad de Nueva York. We came here to uh, live a dignified life, but also to contribute back to the city that has brought us so much. Solamente queremos que nos apoyen. Queremos pedirle al presidente Biden de parte de nosotros los emigrantes que nos ayuden con permiso de trabajo para seguir contribuyendo a la gran ciudad de Nueva York. 
I just want to say that on behalf of migrants, we ask President Biden to give us the uh, ability to work, to give us the right to work, so that we can contribute back to the city of New York and others that have opened the door for us to be here. Y así poder eh, tener una vida digna que nos merecemos como seres humanos todos. So that we can have a dignified life that we all deserve as human beings. Y poder ayudar a nuestras familias que es lo que más queremos y poder seguir adelante con nuestros caminos. So that we can provide for our families and continue forward in our journey. Muchas gracias a todos por su cordial atención. Quisiera agregarle sinceramente. This has been breaking news. 